During World War II, the lifeline for the island nation of Malta were supply convoys protected by a small fleet of warships. Without this protection, Malta could have been starved into surrender. As a tribute to their courage, the Sea Hunters searched for the remains of one of these hero ships lost in action. Join the Sea Hunters as they search the remains of a modern Knight of Malta, the heroic destroyer HMS Southwold. With over 100 million books in print, Clive Custler is the grand master of shipwreck tales and adventure. Director of the Vancouver Maritime Museum, James Delgado is one of the world's foremost marine archaeologists. With over 20 years diving experience, Mike Fletcher is an internationally renowned dive master. Leading the Econova dive team, John Davis has coordinated shipwreck searches around the globe. Together, they explore the planet's last frontier in search of true adventures with famous shipwrecks. They are the Sea Hunters. This is Malta. It is an archipelago in the Mediterranean Sea, an island nation that lies 58 miles or 93 kilometers off the coast of Sicily. Malta is strategically located at the crossroads of the shipping lanes between Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. Malta's coastal waters are littered with the bones of shipwrecks. Some are thousands of years old. Some are as old as yesterday. Perched between Africa and Europe, the island nation of Malta has been swept by the tides of history. Every great movement in Western civilization has washed over the island and its people often leaving its mark in blood and battle. Hitler and Mussolini saw Malta as the linchpin that would weld together their European and African possessions. They hurled the might of their air forces and navies at the island in a siege that lasted three years. All that kept the Maltese alive during these months of attacks was a tenuous flow of supplies delivered by the British merchant fleet. Between these convoys and the enemy stood a small number of Royal Navy destroyers. Outnumbered and outgunned, they fought a long, hard battle, and many did not survive. Now join us as we search the Maltese coastline for one of these ships, a monument to those heroes of Malta, the Royal Navy destroyer, Southwold. Southwold sank during the siege of Malta during World War II. It was a hunt-class destroyer, built for escorting convoys during World War II. That's what Southwold was doing when she went down. According to naval war records, Southwold sank off Massascala Bay in over 75 meters, or 246 feet, of water. Gentlemen, this is HMS Southwold. Sea Hunters John Davis, Mike Fletcher, and James Delgado meet to finalize details of an expedition to the island nation of Malta. Working closely with the Maltese Navy, the team will send veteran diver Rick Haupt to Malta to help find the Southwold. Um, I'm excited about this. This is an important ship. The story deserves to be told, and it gives us a chance to pay some respects to a fallen warrior at the bottom of the sea. I agree. The Maltese Navy has provided the team with the use of a patrol boat as a dive platform. The Maltese Navy is proud of the role the island played during World War II. They're proud of what the Maltese people and the Maltese military withstood and accomplished during that great siege. Helping to find the destroyer, Southwold, is a way for the Navy to preserve the island's military heritage. It's a way of touching the roots of who and what they are. Strong, proud, determined. As a people, as a nation. Phase one in the hunt for the Southwold is a preparation dive just off Gozo, near a unique rock formation called the Blue Hole. They plan to dive down the cliff face to a depth of 70 meters or 230 feet spend 20 minutes on the bottom to adjust their bodies to the effects of breathing nitrogen, then ascend 10 meters and make the most of their decompression time 
by exploring the Blue Hole. The patrol boat takes a course past limestone cliffs that seem like walls to an island fortress. It is hard not to look at them without a sense of majesty and awe. We can only imagine how an attacking foot soldier's heart would plummet at the sight. These limestone cliffs, raised by tectonic activity, have been scaled by ancient and medieval armies. Since the days of the Roman Empire, Malta has been the center of wars fought for control of the Mediterranean Sea. She has been a fortress of defense for the Phoenicians, the Carthaginians, the Romans, the Knights of St. John after the Crusades, the French under Napoleon, and the British during the Second World War. When Hitler's armies swarmed across Europe, Malta once again found herself under siege. Both sides had armies in North Africa and the Middle East. Both sides needed access across the Mediterranean to supply these armies. For both sides, Malta was the key. And yet, in 1940, British Air Force and Army strategists considered Malta indefensible and not worth the cost in supplies and personnel to defend. Winston Churchill, however, thought otherwise. Churchill knew his history. He knew the strategic importance Malta had played throughout the centuries. Hold Malta, Churchill ordered. Hold Malta. In retaliation, the German high command decided to bomb this tiny island to bits. For Malta, 1942 was one horrible year. In the first four months, the Germans dropped over 9,000 tons of bombs on the towns surrounding Grand Harbor. 1942 was the year the Germans had decided to neutralize the island of Malta by breaking the will of its people. This has been called the Second Great Siege at Malta. It is one of the epic struggles of World War II. 1942 was not the first time that the people of Malta faced an invading enemy. In 1565, a Turkish armada attacked the island. The Maltese were defended by 600 knights and 8,000 local militia. The Turkish force consisted of 200 heavily armed galleys and nearly 40,000 professional soldiers. The Maltese stood their ground side by side, wearing down the attackers with nothing but the strength of their own defiance. A rescuing army from Europe ended the battle, driving off the Turks. This was the first great siege of Malta. For the next 500 years, defiance and determination defined the character of the Maltese people. It was this spirit which made them so unwilling to give an inch to the Axis during the Second Great Siege in the 1940s. Before long, they reach the dive site. The team will make the preparation dive into an underwater gorge, a crevice in the earth that local divers call the abyss. It's plenty deep. Dave Harrison is the team's dive coordinator. Everett Reddick is the technical and safety diver. They've set this dive at 70 meters or 230 feet, deep enough to build up the team's tolerance to the effects of nitrogen narcosis. Dave Gadette, the team's underwater cameraman, will use this prep dive to test the underwater camera gear before diving for Southwold. Clear? Chris Harvey Clark, the team's marine biologist, hopes to get some interesting video images of marine life in the deep pools of this cave. Bob Gerton, the above water cameraman, does double duty as a backup safety diver and stills photographer. While some underwater cameras can function in depths of 1,000 feet, most are built for ranges closer to 55 meters or 180 feet. Beyond that, the pressure is so great that mechanical parts such as the zoom mechanism slow down or simply won't move at all.
as a safety precaution, Rick positions their mobile dive boat, a Zodiac, above the abyss. A school of amberjacks seems to welcome Bob Girton into their world. The divers follow the cliff face into an abyss that seems to fall forever. They descend to their predetermined maximum depth, careful not to let the attraction of the abyss take them too deep. The sheerness of the cliff and the way it plunges into the darkness below sparks a feeling of suspended animation, as though the divers are dangling in that narrow interval between space and time. Even the sunlight seems to hang in layers over monstrous crevices and gigantic rocks which are millions of years old. At 70 meters, or 230 feet, the camera is giving Dave some trouble. The lens will zoom in just fine, but under so much pressure, it won't zoom out. At this depth, he has to be careful. He wants the camera in good shape for the dive on Southwold. 15 minutes on the bottom is enough time for their bodies to adjust. Now they rise to the decompression stage. They'll use the next 30 minutes of decompression time to explore the Blue Hole Caves. Caves are like sanctuaries, sacred places with vaulted ceilings which arc into domes of majesty and mystery. It is a completely different dive experience from diving a shipwreck. Touching the cave walls is almost like touching the underside of the Earth's skin. Diving the depths of a cave's deepest pools is like plunging into the center of the Earth's soul. The cave walls were once a seabed, a deposit of algae and sand, which over millions and millions of years cemented together and became rock hard. With more accumulations, a strata of rock formed. 10 million years ago, continental drift brought Africa crashing into Eurasia. The enormous pressure squeezed the seabed, folding the sea bottom and lifting it upward. Rock tops appeared above sea level. These became the Maltese Islands. For the next 10 million years, these islands were beaten by the sea scoured by torrential rains and torn asunder by earthquakes. Cliffs and bays were carved into the rugged coast and caves hollowed into the bottom of the sea. These tunnels narrow through time, squeezing the divers between eons of rock wall where they are lured by the breaking sunlight to go deeper and deeper into yesterday. Sunlight pours into the darkness and lights the way to the surface. A radiance, a spiritual symbol of hope. 
like Southwold was to the people of Malta as she led convoys through to the embattled island. How welcome a column of sunlight would have been to the Maltese people during World War II after another long, dark night of continuous bombing. In 1942, the bombing was unmerciful and unforgiving. It threatened the supply lines of convoys Malta depended upon for survival. The bombing seemed to last forever. People sought refuge in the hundreds of caves on the island. Others hid in the basements of public buildings, in ancient catacombs, and in churches. The people prayed and prayed. Each time an Allied convoy successfully ran the gauntlet of German bombers and battleships to deliver food and supplies to this tiny island, it seemed their prayers were answered. Dave Gaudet has difficulty negotiating the narrow passages with a camera. This one may be a little too narrow. The decompression time is up. It's time to surface. Everett is not far away. He signals Dave that up ahead the passage is wider. It leads to another shaft of sunlight, another opening from a world of darkness into a world of light. Dave's choice is simple. Squeeze yourself into the light or return to the darkness the way you came. Dave angles the camera and himself and squeezes through and into the brilliant sunlight, like the ships of Malta's lifeline, threading the needle between the cannons of the Axis navies and the bombs of the Luftwaffe. It has been a good dive, a dive full of symbols for this island's history, darkness and light. Tomorrow, the team will dive for another symbol of this island's past, to a site once thought to be the South Wall. The preparations complete. The team is ready for the dive on the wreck. The hunt for South Wall begins. They steam to a dive site a mile and a half, or 2.4 kilometers, outside Marsaxalock Bay. The buoys mark the dive site. The team takes time preparing for this dive. They go over their gear and safety procedures with care. After 20 years of shipwreck hunting, Rick knows that every dive site is different and that a dive plan for one will not necessarily apply to another. Local divers know the currents and how they change with the tides. They also understand how different wind conditions can affect the strength of those currents, and how the wind funneling along the cliffs can blow in sudden gusts, creating upward surges in the water at depths well below the surface. As planned, Rick meets up with a dive team called Deep Five. Two of their divers, Mike Cooper and Emmy Farugia, will join the team on today's dive. Emmy has been diving these waters for several years, and knows them as well as anyone. Because a diver should make only one deep dive per day, Mike and Emmy have set safety lines on the wreck and will now dive to tie oxygen tanks on the line of the decompression stages. Once they surface, the Sea Hunters team will dive with the camera gear. Captain Xavier has positioned the ship a few hundred meters or about a thousand feet from the dive site in shallower water where her anchor can reach the bottom. 
Too many boats at the dive site increase the chance of fouling the dive lines. I think we'll be safe here. Because they were supposed to come up on the lines, though. The deep dive has everyone feeling anxious. It's like having butterflies in the stomach before a big event. It gets the adrenaline pumping, and that has everyone eager to get diving. Computer is on. Sure. All right. Okay. So, 19 on the bottom. 19, 7. Huh? Clear. Watch your feet. Sunlight penetrates deep. Visibility is more than 30 meters or 98 feet. If there's anything down here, the team should have no trouble seeing it. The descent is slow and calculated. Five meters or 115 feet and still descending. Sunlight reaches even deeper. In the clear water below, the wreck appears like a shadow on the bottom. Dave Gadette sees something strange about this wreck. Clearly, this wreck is not the Southwold. The team studied photos of Southwold and line drawings of Hunt class destroyers before making this dive. But this wreck looks nothing like what they saw in the photos and line drawings. Southwold was 85 meters, or 280 feet long, with a beam of 9.6 meters, or 31.6 feet. This wreck is too small to be a destroyer. And the shape of it is wrong. It doesn't have the sleek look of a destroyer. This wreck is not the Southwold. Dave explores the exterior of the wreck from bow to stern. He starts up the port side and returns along the starboard side past broken davits for lifeboats, capstans, and open hatch covers. Dave Harrison notes the ship has a single funnel which is fed by two boilers. The double boiler is an indication that this ship had muscle. The drive shaft running from the side of the ship suggests that this wreck may have been a paddle wheeler. That could date the wreck to before the Second World War. But did this ship go to the bottom during World War I? The wreck that the team found was not Southwold. One of the distinguishing features on the wreck, though, was a paddle wheel shaft that came out of his sides. That indicated that it was a very specific type of vessel, a type of vessel represented only by three specific ships that were in Malta during the Second World War. They were sidewheel paddle tugs. One of them, the wreck that the team found, was the 1910 built paddle tug Hellespont. She arrived in Malta in 1922 and worked in the Grand Harbor until damaged in an air raid in 1940. While still waiting for repairs, she was sunk in another attack in 1942. After the war, the Maltese raised her and sank her off the coast in an undetermined location. Sounds are hollow inside a wreck at the bottom of the sea. The rasp of metal on metal, the groan of a hull under stress, the scurry of shadows, the ache of bending light.
down below, the dive team treats the wreck with respect. The coordinates for locating the wreck are recorded and protected by the Maltese government, so this gravesite can be preserved forever. Though they can see the surface, even at this depth, they are not home free from the risk of diving deep. Having reconfirmed that this wreck is not the British destroyer Southwold, the team begins the first stage of their ascent to the surface. At the first decompression stop, the divers will hang on the dive line for 30 minutes and breathe pure oxygen. The deeper a diver goes, the greater the pressure the body feels. For a diver breathing compressed air, the increased pressure causes the body to store nitrogen gas in body tissue. The oxygen will help dissolve the bubbles of nitrogen in their body tissue that prevents clotting in their blood. Oxygen also energizes a diver's sapped strength. Captain Xavier has alerted Rick to the changing currents. The buoys on the surface are being swirled. This could tangle the dive lines. Rick speeds by in the Zodiac to see if there's anything he can do. Sure enough, as the divers ascend to the second decompression stop, they find the dive lines have tangled. Getting tangled in dive lines is every diver's nightmare. The currents are stronger, and the surging surface water is stirring up the dive team. That makes this last decompression stage more dangerous than it should be. In his efforts to untangle the lines, Dave Gaudet has lost a camera lens. He hollers to Dave Harrison below, but the lens falls past him to the bottom. Already, this is a costly dive. Rick knows the lines are twisted, but there's not much he can do to help. The divers are struggling against that downward surge of water. They have to hang on to these swinging, twisting lines for 12 minutes. Already, the jerking motion is taking its toll. After diving so deep, and now being whipped up and down on the dive lines, they're exhausted. The sudden surges are driving the divers below the decompression stage. That could throw off the decompression and leave nitrogen bubbles in their body tissue. Dave can't hold the camera any longer. He's feeling sharp pains in his shoulder and back. He passes the camera to Everett. When they reach the surface, Dave is still feeling pain in his arm, shoulder, and back. It could be a symptom of the bends. The concern now was to get Dave to the patrol boat, and if necessary, to a recompression chamber in port. Rick alerted Captain Xavier about the possible danger, and the captain has called for an emergency helicopter. While the helicopter hovers, Chris runs Dave through a series of reflex tests. Dulled reflexes are an indication of the bends. Before we could ask our team to go into a foreign country and make dives at these sort of depths, 
We had to know that we had in place an emergency medical procedure that could deal with emergencies. And in the case of Malta, we had their Navy standing by, not only with their helicopter, but with their physicians and their recompression chambers. If Dave's incident is related to the spinal cord, if it's a CNS hit, then he's going to require immediate airlift out of there to one of these facilities. But now it's up to Chris. He'll decide, first of all, is it dive related? And then he'll assess the seriousness of that incident. Dave has full feeling in his limbs and his reflexes are sharp. Chris thinks the pain is from being ripped up and down the dive line. Dave takes another hit of pure oxygen, just in case he has nitrogen bubbles in his blood. Nitrogen bubbles could linger in a joint and at any time break free and go straight to the brain, causing permanent disability. That was close. It isn't the bends, but muscle strain. With the danger over, the team decides on a day of rest to recover from this deep dive. Then they will move to the next site and prepare to descend once more to the remains of the South Wall. There's a peacefulness about Malta today and a gentleness that seems centuries from this island's nightmare of 1942. That was the worst year of the war for Malta. During the winter of 1942, food was running out. People were desperate for the arrival of a supply convoy that had left Alexandria for Malta on March 20th. The convoy was codenamed MW-10. Rear Admiral Philip Vion was in command. The convoy consisted of four cargo ships and a Navy escort of cruisers and destroyers. One of the destroyers was Southwold. Alexandria is nearly 1,000 miles or 1,500 kilometers from Malta. On March 21st, the convoy slipped through Bomb Alley off the coast of Crete. It then entered open water beyond the range of its own air support. That's when the enemy air attack started. Italian torpedo bombers attacked first, followed by the German Luftwaffe. The cruisers and destroyers held off the air attack, pounding the sky with their Orlikons and pom-poms. It wasn't enemy planes, however, that Rear Admiral Vion was most concerned about. What worried him was the fleet of Italian warships that was steaming hard across the Gulf of Sirte on a course aimed at cutting off the convoy. As the Luftwaffe pulled off the attack, the enemy ships came into sight. The Italians had a group of destroyers, cruisers, and a battleship. Firepower from the battleship was more than Vion's cruisers and destroyers combined. Vion made the first move. He laid a thick smoke screen to hide the convoy. Then using the smoke for cover, Vion's destroyers played hit and run with the Italian Navy. They sailed to within range of the Italian ships, fired their four-inch guns, then they doubled back to hide inside the drifting smoke. The Italians couldn't know how many more Allied cruisers or destroyers were hiding inside the smoke, and they weren't about to plow forward to find out. That doubt and hesitation played into Vion's hands. So did the weather and the sea. The sea had gotten up fast and was now running heavy and breaking into showers of spray. That made range finding difficult for the Italian gun crew. They couldn't determine whether their misses fell long, short, or wide. And then the wind picked up. By early evening, it was blowing a gale. And with the coming darkness, further fighting was out of the question. The Italians would disengage but not before the destroyers, Southwold included, broke from the smoke screen and struck the Italians.
the Italian force was forced to maneuver to evade them and slightly damaged retreat. This Battle of Serti II was over, but the danger wasn't. The convoy still had to sail into Malta under the teeth of one of the heaviest air attacks of the war. Luck has as much to do with finding a shipwreck as skill and experience. Emmy Ferrugia's experience at hunting shipwrecks off Malta helped Rick and the team get lucky. Emmy had asked around the waterfront and found out from two fishermen that less than a year ago they had found their lines in something they said was wreckage on the bottom. The site was closer to the coast than where the team had been diving the Hellespont. Rick brings this information to a Navy hydrographer. The hydrographer plots the eyewitness and military accounts to Southwold sinking, calculates prevailing currents and wind directions, and adds the information from the two fishermen. The result, a red X on a hydrographic chart that may very well pinpoint the wreck site. day off has everyone in good spirits. A Navy doctor checked out Dave Goodett and confirmed that Dave's pains were from muscle strain. The expedition steams out of Marsac's Lock Harbor and tracks backward along the course the convoy had traveled on its way to Malta. The team in the Maltese Navy are convinced this is the dive that will find Southwold. A Navy helicopter, as well as a search and rescue boat are on standby, just in case anything goes wrong. A cup of strong Maltese coffee helps kickstart the team's adrenaline for making this dive. Dave Harrison climbs below to have a close look at the engine room. It's tight down here, almost claustrophobic. Imagine fighting out a war from below deck, hearing, but not seeing the dive bombers and the bombs trapped inside. The terror of never again seeing. Rick confirms the hydrographer's coordinates with the first officer. The officer of the watch logs the dive site coordinates. They predetermine a maximum depth for the dive, the amount of time they can spend on the bottom and how they're going to explore the wreck. They also plan the ascent, the depths of the decompression stage, and the length of time they need to hold at that stage to dissolve nitrogen bubbles from their blood and body tissue. For the next 60 minutes, that dive plan is the Bible on what each team member does and how they do it. Before long, the divers are in the zodiacs and ready to dive. They are positioned directly over the site. 
good job. As the divers descend, the warm surface water begins to cool. On the bottom, the water will be downright cold. At 40 meters or 131 feet down, the sunlight dims, color darkens, and a shadow on the bottom shivers out of the past. As Southwold and the supply convoy approached Malta, the sky was raging with airplanes. In March 1942, the Germans and Italians were inflicting considerable damage on Malta. German Stukas and Messerschmitts flew against Allied hurricanes and Spitfires, all screaming their engines into a frenzy of dogfights. Then the aircraft turned their attention on Southwold's convoy. The ship Clan Campbell was sunk 20 miles from Malta. Over St. Thomas Bay, they dive-bombed the supply ship Breckenshire. One dropped a bomb straight down the funnel. German Stukas dived vertically at their targets. They would come screaming out of the sky and release their bombs at the bottom of the dive. They were accurate within 30 meters, and they proved to be a very deadly weapon. exploded in a glory of smoke and a shower of scrap metal. Breckenshire was badly damaged, but still afloat, still loaded with the food and supplies that were so desperately needed on the island. Southwold, Doubleton, and Herworth made to defend Breckenshire against diving enemy aircraft. The gun crews were on deck, but the Dulverton and Herworth were soon helpless against the frenzy of dive bombers and the strafe of gunfire. Their guns were quiet. They were out of ammunition. Most of the crews were 20-year-old boys who had turned into men with the war. Their courage tested again and again. But never so much as when they stood on the decks of these helpless ships as they raced to shore to rearm. Southwold, now the lone protector of Breckenshire, threw a line over to tow it to shore. The crew was just tying off the line when Southwold hit an enemy mine. The engine room was the blast hole. An officer and four sailors were killed in the explosion. Water flooded the lower decks. Southwold sagged and listed to the starboard. The destroyer Doubleton returned, drawing alongside to rescue the crew and help the wounded. Suddenly, the sound of Southwold's ripping steel roared and screamed across the water. The sound seemed to hang in the air for as long as Southwold stayed afloat. When the ship went down, so did that shattering sound. As the divers go deeper, the shadow on the bottom comes into focus. It has the clean lines of a destroyer rolled on her starboard side. It looks like it could be a hunt class. Is it Southwold? The team recalled the hours spent poring over the photographs and plans of the destroyer. This broken wreck matches perfectly. Here lies the South World. to a depth of 75 meters, or 246 feet. That's much deeper than the dive plan allows. And Dave Harrison has to remind Chris not to let his camera work take him any deeper than he already is. One look at that deck gun and it's not hard to imagine the faces of those young sailors as they tried to get a tow line on the disabled ship Breckenshire.
Many were at their battle stations, crouched behind oricons and pom-poms, helpless against the planes, because they were out of ammunition. Others were at the gunnels, their hands chafed from pulling hard at the tow line. Their faces stretched with fear as bombers strafed the deck with gunfire. How sudden it came. The explosion blew a deafness into the ears of many on deck. And when that blast finally blew itself out, the steel ship screamed in pain. To the bottom it screamed, where that tortured sound is now muffled in the past. The hunt for the destroyer Southwold has been a success. This ship provides the Maltese people with a treasured symbol which honors those who defended this island during World War II and pays tribute to their courageous spirit, their suffering, and their sacrifice. The Sea Hunters dive team left Southwold undisturbed. What they take from this discovery is the proud feeling of accomplishment and a memory of a brief closeness with those who gave their lives that Malta might live. And now it's your turn to get up off that couch and go into the deserts, go into the mountains, go into the lakes, the rivers, and the seas and search for history. You'll never have a more rewarding adventure. Join us again as we search the oceans of the world for lost and famous shipwrecks. Another true adventure with the Sea Hunters.